Seven o'clock. Thank you, Sean. Thank you, everybody. Welcome to Position of Neutrality. Welcome to New Freedom. A um, couple things tonight. Chaplain Lee is not in the house. He's having some health issues, so those of you who are praying people, if you would keep Chaplain Lee in your prayers, we would appreciate that. He could definitely use the uplifted spirit from this place. But we always open with a prayer, and tonight who is in the house is Wayne. He's coming up to open us up. All right, if we could stand to our feet. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Oh, Heavenly Father, we just come to you tonight, Lord, and we ask that you pour out your blessing and healing on Chapley tonight, Lord. We ask that you speak through Joe tonight, Lord God, that we may all be edified, that we may go out and spread your light into the world. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you, Wayne, and thank you to all of you members, staff, family that came out to see us. Is there anyone in the room tonight that's here for the very first time? Oh, good. First, very good. So welcome to you. Um, we'll warn you in advance, you may experience us just a little different than other meetings of other fellowships you may have attended. And the primary reason that's liable to happen is that we intend for you to have a different experience here. What we do here at Position in Neutrality, we've been doing for lots of years. We simply take a look at the instructions for a step or so a week directly out of this book. We use this book in 12-step recovery. Why? It works. The process described by the authors of this book has been proven to work for addicts of the hopeless variety, addicts to alcohol and other substances, yes? yes. And in our particular model, it's been proven to alleviate human condition for all kinds of disorders, yeah? Some of us didn't have active substance abuse problems, but we had some behavioral disorders that were problematic, yeah? yeah. <laughs> That's the rumor. Okay. So tonight we're going to take a look at the step one experience, and we'll warn you in advance, the step one experience is going to have some highs and some lows. Right? If, if we get all the way through a step one experience and it's all unicorns and glitter, perhaps we've missed something. <laughs> the, the experience of powerlessness and unmanageability is a painful process, a, a brokenness, if you will, that seems necessary for us to come to ourselves and go in another direction, yes? yes. So we're going to be unapologetic about sharing that so that we can, we can feel it and, and, and share that experience, right? Okay, so I want to start tonight um, in the forward to the first edition. If you're following in your book, it's uh, Roman numeral X, I, I, I. And they start out, we of Alcoholics Anonymous are more than 100 men and women who have recovered from a seemingly hopeless state of mind and body. To show other alcoholics precisely how we have recovered is the main purpose of this book. So who'd they tell us we was? The first 100. The first 100. And they also told you they wrote this book to show others. Notice how they did not say to tell others. So because they were intentional with their words, how many of you have had a spiritual awakening as the result of these steps and it's now understands why they said they had somebody sit down and show you how to find your experience in this text. Because it's really not just the average textbook. It's very hard to read because it's testimony. And it's all kinds of other things mixed in, right? They, they write from different perspectives. You ever notice that? They write in present tense. They write in past tense. They write in third person. They write in first person. And if someone doesn't show me how to read it, I'm lost. I think I'm reading a storybook. Yes? Yeah. When I'm really reading a testimony of what it feels like to discover that power down on the inside. Right. Okay. So I'm going to go right from there to something I don't normally do. I'm going to take a brief look at the doctor's opinion. And then I'm going to jump into another section of the book that we haven't done uh, before and see if we can share a 
step one experience that leaves us with, a, with an idea and a hope for a future. Fair enough? So I'm in, in the doctor's opinion XXVII, and I'm at the very bottom of that page. And the doctor's opinion says, of course, an alcoholic ought to be freed from his physical craving for liquor. So what are they telling us about craving in the doctor's model? It's physical. And then they're saying, and this often requires a definite hospital procedure before psychological measures can be of maximum benefit. So what are they talking about there? Detox. Probably talking about some form of detox. And they're saying they're going to have to detox me before they can work on my mind where the main problem centers. Yes? How many of you have had to detox before your head cleared enough to understand what was up? So it says, we believe and so suggested a few years ago that the action of alcohol on these chronic alcoholics is a manifestation of an allergy. So how many of you have been confused over the years when they talk about an allergy to alcohol, an allergy to whatever chemical chases it? Any of you ever get confused or dismiss it right away? Because we, we're not being very clear in helping people find their experience there. How many, do I have any drinkers in the room? Yep. <laughs> when you drank, did you find that alcohol stimulated you? Yes. It's a sedative. So a medical person looking at you being stimulated by a sedative might opine that may be the manifestation of an allergy. Where's my opiate addicts? Need I say more? Any, any of you get energized when you got hooked up? Yeah. The minute you got fixed, right? You're out there doing your chores. Everyone's saying, look how good he's doing. <coughs> Where's my meth addicts? Did you, did you find that stuff kind of calmed you down? Yes. Cleared up your thinking? Okay, so that may be the manifestation of an allergy. We don't know, it's just the doctor's opinion. But if you are stimulated by sedatives and if you are sedated by stimulants, you might want to read further. <laughs> Does that make sense? Yes. So the phenomenon of craving is limited to this class. What class? People that have determined they have a reaction to these chemicals different than their peers. Any of you ever noticed that? Nobody? Yeah. Oh, I'm starting to feel that. I'm pushing it away. Uh, and never occurs in the average temperate drinker. How many in a never? Not even once. So you might ask yourself, have I ever had this abnormal reaction? Yes. And if you ever have had, it doesn't necessarily mean you're alcoholic or an addict, but it does mean you're not the average temperate drinker. Yes. So we're checking one off. Does that make sense? Yes. So it says these allergic types can never, how many in there never? never. Safely use alcohol in any form at all. Notice how they use the word safely. That's really for the people who, well, yes, it happens to me sometimes, but it doesn't happen to me every time. Any, any of you in that class? So the only question we have for you is if it's happened to you sometimes, but it doesn't happen to you every time, do you know which time it's going to happen to you? No. And if the answer is no, then it's never safe. Because you never really had control, because you couldn't control when you could control and when you couldn't control. Okay. And then it says, and once having formed the habit and found they cannot break it. Is that true for anyone? Yeah. I was having some complexity with stopping and staying stopped in spite of my outcomes. Yes? Yeah. Once having lost their self-confidence. Yeah. 
Evidence of having lost self-confidence is showing up in recovery fellowships. Yeah. I, I now think I need support. Some of us took it a little further. Yes, Sean. <laughs> That's where he met me. He likes to bring that kind of shit up. Uh, their reliance upon things human. How many of you made several resolutions and then defied your own resolutions? How many of you had lots of people try and talk you out of If you loved me, you'd stop. And you loved them. And you didn't stop. How many of you had people lock you up, chain you down, and you got undone and went again? Well, it says with, if those things are happening, their piles, their problems pile up on them and become astonishingly difficult to solve. How many of you could write a list of how astonishingly difficult these things get to solve? <laughs> Okay, so then it says, frothy emotional appeal seldom suffices. People pleading with us to do better. And we just sincerely want to do better, but we can manifest no outside action to show we want to do better. Anyone feeling me? The message which can interest and hold these alcoholic people must have depth and weight. In nearly all cases, their ideals must be grounded in a power greater than themselves if they are to recreate their life. That's the doctor's opinion. When we talk to you of depth and weight, we're not trying to tell you great gnarly stories about what a badass drinker or drugger I am. What I'm trying to talk to you about is the depth of a human condition completely without hope, completely self-absorbed, completely dishonest, full of guilt, shame, and remorse, snatched from that place to a place where I'm willing to go witness to anybody at any time about the restoration power that animates me. Yeah. And no matter who you are, that will generally get your attention if you're in a similar state, yes? yes. Okay, so now I'm going to jump to what we don't always do. I'm going to go to chapter... Two, and I'm going to get into page 18. I'm going to go through a little different path through the first step because we always go through Bill's story here just because we like stories. But I want to do some stuff more collective tonight. So on page 18, the top of the page, it says, an illness of this sort, and we have come to believe it an illness. How many of you had a hard time believing you had an illness when you first came to recovery? How many of you stayed in recovery for a while and still didn't believe it an illness? I was just behaving the way I wanted to, and now it's hard to stop behaving the way I want to so much. Anyone know what I'm talking about? Because at some part of our core, we, we still like the idea that we're choosing what's going on with us, huh? Because none of us wants to actually admit to powerlessness. I desperately want this, but this is my outcome. Anyone know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Okay. So we got a process where we come to believe. In the process of coming to believe in an illness, I come to believe in my great need for a healer. Yes? Yeah. So, and we have come to believe in an illness. It, it involves those around us in a way no other human sickness can. If a person has cancer, all are sorry for him and no one is angry or hurt. But not so with the alcoholic illness. For with it, there goes the annihilation of all things worthwhile in life. Take that in. How many of you can consider all the things worthwhile in your life at certain times in your addiction that really annihilate is a good term, isn't it? I'm, I'm hoping some of you are feeling what I'm talking to you about. Some of you are because I can feel you. We, we want to go into the experience of powerlessness and unmanageability. We want to talk about the warped lives of blameless children. Those things that we all know intimately. Those things we swore we would never be, but this thing on us makes us be. Yes? It engulfs, engulfs all those whose lives touch the sufferers. 
It brings misunderstanding, <coughs> fierce resentment, financial insecurity, disgusted friends and employers, warped lives of blameless children, sad wives and parents. Anyone can increase the list. Did everyone kind of go through that list and check it off in your own experience? Yes. And, I, and I apologize. I, I tried to warn you, but I'm telling you, this is a difficult experience, but a necessary. I've got to own my own brokenness. I've got to own my own personal powerlessness because it is in owning that that I come to myself and can experience this power that's going to take me out of it. Does it make sense? Okay, so I'm going to jump down to about three paragraphs down, and I talk about the model that formed New Freedom, the model that formed the Modern Fellowship of AA, what this book records as the manner of living. It's all in italics. It said, but the ex-problem drinker who has found this solution. Now, many people over the years have thought the steps are our solution. No, they're not. The steps reveal a solution to us through us. Does that make sense? Another set of rules ain't going to help me, but power is what I lack, and power is what I must find. Yes? Who is properly armed with the facts about himself can generally win the entire confidence of another alcoholic in a few hours. Until such an understanding is reached, little or nothing can be accomplished. Why does that matter to people at New Freedom? Well, because we use this very same model. A convict, properly armed with the facts about himself, can generally win the, con the, the confidence of another convict in a few hours. Until such an accommodation is reached, little or nothing can be accomplished. So for 13 years, and longer than that, the state has been satisfied with releasing people knowing 50% were coming right back. And we started this a little over three years ago, and we knew this manner of living would restore people from that. We were talking to them for years before that while they were incarcerated. And in three years' time, over all those numbers, 4,000 people that came through, 95%, if they graduated, have not gone back. And if they just engaged with us and stayed in touch with us, only 13% of them went back. So I, I want you to understand why we're so emphatic about this and what we do here, because we are those who society had written off, and we're here to say we're back, and we're transforming communities and lives and we're solving problems for generations that aren't even born yet. And for those people that are hearing about our demise, go out and tell them, we're here, we're putting in new carpet, we're repainting the place, we parked, painted the parking lot, we ain't going anywhere. Power! God? There you go. Okay, so I'm going to jump from there over to page 20, and let's do some self-diagnosis. I'm at the bottom of that page. It said moderate drinkers. Now, we've already determined we may not be moderate. Any of you determined that moderation is not your strong point? But anyway, let's go through it. Moderate drinkers have little trouble in giving up liquor entirely if they have good reason for it. How many of you have had good reason to stop doing what you were doing and still could not stop and stay stopped? Okay, so you're probably not moderate. Okay? Then it says they can take it or leave it alone, which seems to indicate they can turn the switch on and off. I looked for one. <laughs> um, then we have a certain type of hard drinker. How many of you were proud of the amount you could consume? So we'd like to find ourselves there, right? How many of you went from bragging about how much you drank to lying about how much you drank? <laughs> yeah, it loses its appeal after a while, doesn't it? 
he may have the habit badly enough to gradually impair him physically and mentally. It may cause him to die a few years before his time. Now they're going to give us an important qualification. If a sufficiently strong reason, ill health, falling in love, change of environment, or the warning of a doctor becomes operative, this man can also stop or moderate, although he may find it difficult and troublesome and may even need medical attention. So what's that tell you? This person may have some scrapes. They may end up in detox with me. But maybe going to detox with me was sufficient reason for them. And now they can stop or moderate. And they're going to walk into a recovery room I'm in. And they're going to tell me of a plan. Well, I just don't pick up no matter what. And you, have you ever met those guys? My problem is that plan sounds a lot better than my plan. My plan requires self-searching, leveling of pride, confession of shortcomings, a life of service to others. That's what my plan requires. But you know why? Because I pick up no matter what. Have yeah. <laughs> yeah. you ever heard they just put the plug in the jug? I know I'm talking to a non-drinker. Dude, I never kept the plug because once that motherfucker came out, I had no need for it. So, I am not a hard drinker, I have discovered. So now they're going to talk about what I discovered I am, and you'll, this is your time to get honest with yourself if you might fit in this category. But what about the real alcoholic? You ever heard the people in the rooms that identified themselves as a real alcoholic? And if you're new to recovery, you think they're bragging. No, they're telling you, no, I'm the guy that really needs to read this book. Not only that, I need to put into action what this book teaches. What about the real alcoholic? He may start off as a moderate drinker. How many of you did that? How many of you had a long runway? Maybe drank into middle age. You're not young enough to have had a long runway. I ain't even taking that from you. Sean had a long runway. I, on the other hand, poquito. <laughs> You know what I'm talking about? I was hospitalized for alcohol poisoning the first time at age 10. I managed to drink successfully until about 23. <laughs> successfully means fewer arrests than drinking outings. Poquito. <clears throat> it may or may not become a continuous hard drinker. So how many of you went right from somewhat moderate to off the rails? And so how many of you kind of did a bounce through the hard drinker thing? Yeah. But at some stage of his drinking career, he begins to lose all control of his liquor consumption once he starts to drink. So we're back to the one symptom we have in common, that abnormal reaction. Does it make sense? Yeah. So you have to ask yourself, it's not a matter of can you stop and stay stopped, what happens when you start again? How difficult is it for you to manage it once you've started putting chemicals in your body? How many of you have enacted the plan? I'm just going to do a little bit for this special occasion. Then I'm all... And found out that the occasion stretched on. How many of you got a sobriety date and then got miserable and thought... And then it got out there a ways, and you go, I'm just going to pick a sobriety date that's meaningful to me, so I, I'll just pick one. That may be you. Is what, okay. So if any of that resonates, here's the fellow who's been puzzling you. See how they're writing this in third person? They do not want to offend my already delicate ego that's trying to defend the only source of life I know, which is the spirits I imbibe. Does that make sense? Like I can't imagine in my active addiction a life that doesn't include spiritual release. I happen to get mine in various forms, always external. Yes? 
So here's the fellow who's been puzzling you, especially in his lack of control. How many of you were puzzled by your lack of control? How many of you were puzzled anyone wanted control? <laughs> I never know the kind of room I'm sitting in, but it's like... Okay. So he does absurd, incredible, tragic things while drinking. Is that true? Yeah. Says he's a real Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. They're talking about a personality change. Any of you have a personality change when you're... He's seldom mildly intoxicated. He's always more or less insanely drunk. Where's my drinker? How many of you were insanely drunk but didn't think yourself insanely drunk? That's, that's, that's another thing that we have to help people see because I, I ran at a high blood alcohol content. Anyone else? So I'd end up in a detox, which I appropriately belonged in. They would freak out over my blood alcohol content. Say, dude, you should be hospitalized. And I would say, hence my arrival. <laughs> I'm parked in the fire zone. Can you help me get my car in a spot? <laughs> I did not think myself. Anyone know what I'm talking about? Okay. So his disposition while drinking resembles his normal nature, but little. How many of you don't even know what your normal nature is? A lot of us come into recovery and we got no idea what our normal nature is. And it takes a while. How many of you have started to discover that you're more childlike than childish, but you had to let your ego down far enough to start playfulness again and start interacting normally again? So it's, it's a weird awakening, isn't it? He may be one of the finest fellows in the world, yet let him drink for a day and he frequently becomes disgustingly and even dangerously antisocial. How many of you have had that experience or watched it with your friends and loved ones? Like they're fine. That's my brother, man, solid dude. And then two days later, he's under the bridge and he's knocking people on the head to get, like, man, that's my bro. Right? Come on, I'm talking to you guys about real shit. Maybe you were the guy. Yeah, it's okay to say amen or ouch, right? That's what chap tells you. <laughs> okay. So, he has a positive genius for getting it tight at exactly the wrong moment. It's particularly when some important decision must be made or engagement kept. How many of you have finally got the kids back? Got an opportunity to go to court and do something, then didn't make it. Or let them down again. Any of you? Yes. Any of you ever finally get the family to invite you back and then? Okay. So it's okay to go through this range of feeling. We're going through the experience of powerlessness and unmanageability, yes? Okay. So he's often perf perfectly sensible and well balanced concerning everything except liquor. But in that respect, he's incredibly dishonest and selfish. How many of you spent all the household money on your, on your high? How many of you lied about where the money went? <clears throat> so I was perfectly okay to go participate, but when it came between meeting the obligations of the household and meeting my spiritual need, I, I went and saw the dope man. Yeah. I wasn't proud of it. I just what I did. Anyone else? He often possesses special abilities, skills, and aptitudes and has a promising career ahead of him. How many of you had some pretty good skills? People described you as someone who had potential. <laughs> when, you, when you start getting past your 30s, they quit talking about your potential. <laughs> <laughs> they start talking about the wasted life that you're living. So if you're, if you're under 30, you know, do you? If you're over 30, that whole potential thing, that ship sailed. <laughs> you, know, you get your feet under you, let's go. Let's go to work. There's people out there who need your story. Okay. He uses his gifts to build up a bright outlook for his family and himself and then pulls the structure down on his head by a senseless series of sprees. Here's the f he's the fellow who goes to bed so intoxicated that he ought to sleep the clock around 
Yet early the next morning, he searches madly for the bottle he misplaced the night before. Where's my drinkers? Did y'all hide? Drinkers are hiders. Unless you think you're getting not meth addicts are hiders too. In fact, they're harder to search than the drinker. Drinkers always clank. Meth addicts got little baggies in their underwear liners and everything. If he can afford it, he may have liquor concealed all over the house to be certain no one gets his entire supply away from him to throw down the waste pipe. A lot of us that hid stuff didn't want other people to know that we knew that, but we always had more than one place where stuff was. Yeah? Yeah. There was one in the car, and there was one in the closet. As matters grow worse, he begins to use a combination of high-powered sedative and liquor to quiet his nerves so he can go to work. How many of you started a little better living through chemistry? Went to the hospital and found out that what you really had was not alcoholism, but a a little bit of a Valium deficiency. <laughs> just the right touch of Valium with the right amount of gin or vodka could really just set the tone for the day. Any of you have? <laughs> so that, then comes the day when he simply cannot make it and he gets drunk all over again. Perhaps he goes to a doctor who gives him morphine or some sedative with which to taper off. Any of you do that? How many of you discovered once you start going into that opiate lane, while opiates can help you detox off alcohol, pretty cool, alcohol is not worth a damn at getting you off opiates. (laughs) And then he begins to appear at hospitals and sanitariums. So have we roughly identified anyone in the room? That is the real alcoholic. If you, and it, if, if you found yourself in those pages or fear you may have found yourself in that section, now is why you want to read through the rest of the book and not just read it. Find someone who can show you how to read it and then do what it says. Does it make sense? Okay. So they talk about this. This is by no means a comprehensive picture of the true alcoholic as our behavior patterns vary, but this description should identify him roughly. Why does he behave like this? See how they're in third person? They're expecting you to be reading it. And you go, oh yeah, I know guys like that. Why do they behave like that? (coughs) How many of you realize that if you're reading this book, it's probably you. If hundreds of experiences have shown him that one drink means to another debacle with all its attendant suffering and humiliation, why is it that he takes that one drink? Have you ever asked yourself that? Yes. More than once. And don't limit yourself if you're, I'm not a drinker, don't go there. Whatever (coughs) chemical had you in its grip, have you ever asked yourself, once you started to recognize this is not turning out well for me on the regular... Why did I return? Because that's an important... Eyesight without insight is spiritual blindness. If I just keep running back to the same trough to drink the same slop, it's no wonder I'm having that. Yes? So at some point i got to ask why. But not out here, in here. Does that make sense? Okay. Why can't he stay on the water wagon? What has become of the common sense and willpower that he still sometimes displays with respect to other matters? Cunning, baffling, powerful. I'm able to do this, but I'm not able to do that. But once I do this, I can't do that. Anybody? Kind of tricky, isn't it? Perhaps there'll never be a full answer to these questions. Opinions vary considerably as to why the alcoholic reacts differently from normal people. So this is just their experience. They're not trying to convince you. We're just trying to illuminate what they say their experience is and see if it fits. And if it does, this is a process that reveals a solution that's worked for millions. Does that make sense? So 
we're not sure why, once a certain point is reached, little can be done for them. We cannot answer the riddle. So now they're going to go a little deeper into the experience. We know that while an alcoholic keeps away from drink, as he may do for months or years, he reacts much like other men. We're equally positive that once he takes any alcohol, whatever, into his system, something happens, both in the bodily and mental sense, which make it virtually impossible for him to stop. How many of you have had that happen? Had some clean time, then for some reason picked up again, and you thought you were going to be able to stop, and no matter how much desire you could summon at any given time, it just was not happening. Okay? So what they said is the experience of any alcoholic will abundantly confirm this. So you've got to ask yourself these questions. We're not, we're not telling you your experience. I'm telling you mine and how I align it with them. Does it make sense? And some of you, I'm feeling you as you're going through this, and you're going, oh, maybe it's worse than I thought. I can feel those thoughts coming up. That's exactly appropriate, right? Let's see who we are here. So it says, these observations would be academic and pointless if our friend never took the first drink, thereby setting the type terrible cycle in motion. So one of the funny things that we sort of teach people in our fellowships that aren't properly armed with the facts about themselves is the insanity of alcoholism or addictive disorder is not the crazy stuff that happens after I put it in my body. That's just what happens to people like me when I put stuff in my body. I go off the rails. I'm a Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. I do incredibly tragic, absurd things when you're using. But the insanity is knowing that about me, having lots of lived experience in that, I do it again. The insanity precedes the drink. It's not after. The insanity precedes the drug, not after. So then it says, that, therefore, the main problem of the alcoholic centers in his mind rather than in his body. They didn't say the only problem. They said the main problem. I'm going to have to get this mind renewed or I'm going to keep doing it regardless of how many resolutions I make based on my experience. If you ask him why he started on that last bender, the chances are he will offer you one of 100 alibis. How many of you... Went out, got loaded again after some time in sobriety, and had a whole bunch of reasons for why. How many of you had a group of friends that would help you find those reasons? I went to treatment. They told me to write down your triggers. You were triggered, Joe. I went to enough treatments by the last one when they released me and they said, write down your triggers. I wrote pulse. If I'm triggered by the world and I am this alcoholic of the hopeless variety, then I might as well cash in now. Sorry. Therapeutic approaches don't work on me. I've proven it. This approach does. And he's proven it with me. Sometimes these excuses have a certain plausibility, but none of them really make sense in the light of a havoc an alcoholic's drinking bout creates. They sound like the philosophy of the man who, having a headache, beats himself on the head with a hammer so that he can't feel the ache. Who got mad at that reference and who giggled? (laughs) You know who you are. If you draw this fallacious reasoning to the attention of an alcoholic, he will laugh it off or become irritated and refuse to talk. What was your response to their analogy <clears throat> I'm not here to tell you what it might be but I have done this thousands of times and with thousands of people and one of those two reactions is inevitable and you just got to own wh- which is you right so then it says once in a while he may tell the truth and the truth strange to say is usually he has no more idea why he took that first drink than you have how many of you got to that place People say, why would you do that again? What happens when you tell people that are disappointed by you that you don't know why? They insist that you do know why, and you go back to lying, huh? 
And I'm not blaming people. I'm just saying that's the response. Everyone wants to know why I would do that in spite of all my promises. I have no idea. And when I say I have no idea, yes, you do. Okay, well, you know, the dog got run over by a... in 65. Okay, so some drinkers have excuses with which they're satisfied part of the time, but in their hearts they really do not know why they do it. Now they're talking to us about a journey. Logically, I have no idea. Down here, I have no idea. But this wants to create a reason. That fight between head and heart. And as we go through the step process, you'll understand why. Because that, that is trying to keep me from here. Because where's the power found? Deep down inside. And how do I find it? I'm going to have to search fearlessly. So they're bumping me from questioning my thinking to how am I feeling. Already in the first step. Does it make sense? Okay. Once this malady has a real hold, they're a baffled lot. There's the obsession that they, somehow, someday, they will beat the game, but they often suspect they're down for the count. How long did you live in that in active addiction? This is not going to end well, but I'll get, I'll get together here in a little bit. How true this is, few realize. In a vague way, their families and friends sense that these drinkers are abnormal, but everybody hopefully awaits the day when the sufferer will rouse himself from his lethargy and assert his power of will. Any of you have family members that would believe you? and You, you got this. You ever heard that? Yeah. You're like, no one, dude, I got nothing. I hope you're not easily disappointed. Right. Like I've already figured out where I'm going while they're trying to pump me up. <laughs> right? The tragic truth is that if man be a real alcoholic, the happy day may not arrive. We're obligated to deliver that message to our brothers and sisters and not some nonsense about, oh, you got this. No, dude, God's got this. You're going to have to give it to him. We got a process that works every time. So it says that he has lost control. How many of you have lost something? They did not say I misplaced it. <laughs> when one loses something, they're not getting that back, are they? No. Because I have lost it. At a certain point in the drinking of every alcoholic, he passes into a state where the most powerful desire to stop drinking is of absolutely no avail. Ask yourself, have you seen that point in you and others where you desperately had a desire to stop? How many of you have taken people through the steps? You could feel the spirit on them. They told you about the sorrow they had for everything they did, and the next thing you saw, they're off, gone. So we know this is true. The most powerful desire to stop is of no avail. Yes? This tragic situation has already arrived in practically every case long before it's suspected. Long before I knew there was never going to be a different outcome for me, I had lost the ability to change my correction course. I didn't know that until later. I learned it from other people who did not get their course changed. Yes? So there's, in italics again, the fact is that most alcoholics, for reasons yet obscure, what do they mean reasons yet obscure? Yet I don't know why. I only know that the vast majority of people that are anything like me, if they don't get this, the guys that introduced me to this said, Joe, we got to get you to God before you find a more, before you find a more creative way to get there. And I was very creative. So I was interested. Yeah. I'd been trying, right? So the fact is that most alcoholics, for reasons yet obscure, have lost the power of choice in drink. 
I can know more if I'm this guy. I can't choose to drink or not drink. Does that make sense? People say, well, you made a choice. Not if you're a real alcoholic. Get on top of the roof, jump off. Halfway down, say, I choose to hit the ground. <laughs> Tell me how that statement of empowerment changed your outcome. Because the cycle was in motion, wasn't it? Guys, we got to teach this to people because it's not natural to think this way. But this is experience. It's absolutely the facts for me. I had lost the power to choose. I still don't have the power to choose. I have access to a power that lets me serve. And in the service, abstinence is a byproduct. Our so-called willpower becomes practically non-existent. We're unable at certain times to bring into our consciousness with sufficient force the memory of suffering and humiliation of even a week or a month ago. We're without defense against the first drink. They're separating the idea of memory from consciousness, the awareness of being aware. It isn't that I don't know it's going to suck. I don't know it's going to suck how bad and how long. So I can't bring to consciousness, full awareness, that memory of suffering and humiliation of a week or a month ago. And maybe I can today, but there's a time coming I won't be. Anyone have that experience? So if I'm without defense against the first drink, and I've got to continue to grow spiritually in order to get insurance from that, and the only method for getting that insurance is intensive work one with another, what is my choice to be? I want to get armed with the facts about myself so that I can properly witness to others, yes? Okay. I'm going to jump from there to the next page, page 25, <clears throat> and it says there is a solution. Almost none of us like the self-searching, the leveling of our pride, the confession of shortcomings, which the process requires for its successful consummation. So the authors are clear to tell us the process is not the solution. The process reveals the solution to you through you. We love the solution, men and women. We do not always like the process through which the solution reveals himself to us and through us. Yes? We're talking about power and purpose discovered within us, walked out so that we live a life better than the best we ever imagined, and we put that worst experience of our lives to purpose to avert suffering for others. And in that, we find joy, we find power, we find peace, we find happiness. Yes? Okay. So, then it goes on to tell us that but we saw that it really worked in others. Why does the peer model work? Experience. Because we know where you've been and we let you see where we are and we tell you the only reason you can see it is because you are it and all you got to do is wake up. Yes? And we had come to believe in the hopelessness and futility of life as we had been living it. Who knows of hopelessness and futility in life as well as us? Probably nobody knows what it feels like to act completely out of what I know to be my character and my nature and have no way to stop it. To tremendously feel the shame and remorse of the people I'm letting down. Yes? Yes? So when, therefore, we were approached by those in whom the problem had been solved, there was nothing left for us but to pick up the simple kit of spiritual tools laid at our feet. Are we there? Yes. Yes. We've found much of heaven, and we've been rocketed into a fourth dimension of existence, which we had not even dreamed. What do they mean when we're rocketed into a fourth dimension of existence? At that time, they were, you know, the dimensions were all temporal, right? By the time they started talking about fourth dimension, they were talking beyond time and space, yes? yes? So when you're beyond time and space, what is there? There's now. 
there's now. For infinite beings, there's only now. And if you know your infinite nature, then all of a sudden you're rocketed into this existence where you know your identity. Yes? Yes. yes? So the great fact is just this and nothing less, that we've had deep and effective spiritual experiences. So that's what the process is about. And then I'm going to jump over, because we've got a few minutes, I'm going to jump out of that chapter, and I'm going to go to a chapter called More About Alcoholism and talk about some other things that you may hear in fellowships that we like to call to people's attention that are struggling in our fellowships and may want to be introduced to this manner of living because it makes a difference. Yeah? yeah? Yes. So it says, it says, most of us have been unwilling to admit that we were real alcoholics. How many of you struggle with that as you're reading it and it took a while to get to the place? Not, not an alcoholic, had a few troubles with drinking. I... I I've been selfish and inconsiderate. All those things we're willing to admit. But the real guy, I'm going to drink myself to death. I'm going to take other people with me, and there's absolutely nothing anyone or anything can be done about it. The only thing I, I know for sure is I'm dying, and I don't know when, and I'm miserable. Who's feeling powerless and unmanageable? That's the point. We want to, we want to own that if that's us. No person likes to think he's bodily and mentally different from his fellows. I want to go do what I see them go do. Yes? yes? Therefore, it's not surprising that our drinking careers have been characterized by countless vain attempts to prove that we could drink like other people. How many of you spent a lot of time proving you could drink better than other people? <laughs> and then when it started to get problematic, you spent a lot of time trying to prove that you could drink like a gentleman. Not everybody, but some of us tried to fit. Some of us with business careers that demanded that we did this thought, oh, well, I was just cutting up. I'm going to do this normal now. Now I'm going to need a little eight ball of cocaine in order to pull this bullshit off. But it's going to be all right. All right. So um, the idea that somehow, someday he will control and enjoy his drinking is the great obsession of every abnormal drinker. So they're talking about two mutually exclusive ideas, and you got to weigh it for yourself. Control and enjoy. I could control, but I did not enjoy. Or I could enjoy, there was no control. How many of you relate to me? Now, chemicals are only a symptom. So why you want to enact this manner of living is the main problem is on my mind. So it isn't about talking about what chemical is my drug of choice. I've got a broken thinker that needs to be renewed. So now we change that wording. The idea that he can control and enjoy his thinking is the great obsession of every abnormal thinker. Has more depth to it, doesn't it? See, the reason I want to enter this manner of living isn't because of my drinking. It's because of my thinking. Yes? yes? So then it says, the persistence of this illusion is astonishing. Many of us pursue it into the gates of insanity or death. We learned, who's we? The first, the first 100. We learned that we had to fully concede to our innermost selves that we were alcoholics. This is the first step in recovery. How many of you have been to recovery rooms forever and you saw a different first step on the wall yes. <laughs> did any of you find that confusing yes. it can be because most of us never understood that said that there didn't we? but there's a instruction which they plucked out of chapter five and hung on the wall and there's an experience in step one that the authors describe in more about alcoholism See, the only way this is going to change is I'm going to have to come to myself, fully concede to my innermost self. Some of you who are biblical students know that the prodigal came to eating worse than the pigs. And while he was in that hog farm, he came to himself. And he realized that the servants in his father's house were doing better than he was. Some of you are feeling that. 
So we ain't learned anything new in 2,000 years. I got to get out of this strong-willed, egoic mind, and I got to get back and empower this spirit within me. And if I don't do that, the outcomes for people like me are terrible. Okay? The delusion that we are like other people or presently maybe has to be smashed. I always hear people smashing delusions. The only thing I want to tell you about smashing your own delusion is delusion is the very nature of delusion is that I do not know I have it. So if you're smashing your own delusion, you are indeed delusional. So we alcoholics are men and women who have lost the ability to control our drinking. So that's really the admission of powerlessness initially is just, look, I'm a, I'm a man who's lost the ability to control my drink. It's not that hard. We know that no real alcoholic, why'd they say that? Because they just defined what a real alcoholic was and had us go through the journey to see if I might be that. So they're going to deliver this to me ever in italics. No real alcoholic ever recovers control. So it's, I'm not going to wake from my lethargy. I'm not going to have a different set of circumstances wherein it's safe. I can do it again. It's just not going to be safe. Does that make sense? I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to me. This book is not written for how you should behave. This book is written, once I learn how to read it, for a hopeful message on how if I will try and behave, it won't matter to me how the rest of you all behave. It will renew my mind and surrender my judgments and allow me to be uniquely useful. So then it says, we know that no real alcoholic ever recovers control. All of us felt at times that we were regaining control. Any of you? thought, you know, I was making too much of this. I'm doing good now. I only drink on the weekends. And now that I'm working four tens, that's kind of cool. But such intervals usually brief or inevitably followed by still less control. How many of you had that experience? It wasn't that bad, but you got off because it was getting bad enough. And then when you got back on, it got bad quick. Which led in time to pitiful and incomprehensible demoralization. Think of the words they use. Pitiful. To evoke contempt from self or others. Any of you get to that place? Where you really didn't like who you were? And you demonstrated it in how you took care of yourself? Incomprehensible. What are they saying? That kind of contempt that I felt for myself and from others is impossible to comprehend. Guys, how are we going to come back from that without a power greater than ourselves? Demoralization means without fight. They're not talking about my morals. They're talking about my constitution to get up and change the trajectory. People say, if you want to get well, stop digging. Dude, I ain't digging. I'm in free fall. If I'd known before I started on this free fall, I'd have grabbed a shovel, so I'd know. <laughs> Anyone know what I'm talking about? We're convinced to a man that alcoholics of our type are in the grip of a progressive illness. What do they mean? Over any considerable period, we get worse, never better. How many of you have determined that about yourself? Okay. So I'm going to go from there to one more thing. I'm on page 34. For those who are unable to drink moderately, the question is how to stop altogether. We're assuming, of course, that the reader desires to stop. So if you don't want to stop, do you, boo. Whether such a person can quit upon a non-spiritual basis depends upon the extent to which he has already lost the power to choose whether he will drink or not. Many of us felt we had plenty of character, 
There was a tremendous urge to cease forever, yet we found it impossible. This is the baffling feature of alcoholism as we know it, this utter inability to leave it alone no matter how great the necessity or wish. Um, that's the experience of powerlessness and unmanageability. I don't think I want to go any further than that. If you've roughly identified that you need to read further, we'll be here next week. Hmm? Why, what time is it?